Okay. Morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 212. Just a slight change in how we are doing the class today. I'm teaching from home these two hours. So those of you on campus, you're connected online and others as well. Let's pray and get started. I just request somebody to please um, lead us in prayer and we'll get started. Jesus, uh, Lord, uh, we thank you, Lord Father, for this time, oh Lord Father. Thank you, oh Lord Father, for uh, gathering us, oh Lord Father, together, oh Lord Father, to listen, oh Lord Father, and to learn, oh Lord Father, from you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, God, we just invite you into our midst, oh Lord Father. Be present, and uh, we just submit our minds, our hearts, oh Lord Father, into your hands, Jesus. Holy Spirit, God, you just take control over us, O oh Lord Father. Help us to focus, O oh Lord Father. And Jesus, we pray, Lord, that everything that you are teaching, O oh Lord Father, will be like a seed, O oh Lord Father, that was uh, sown in the good ground, O oh Lord Father, that bears uh, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold, O oh Lord Father, for your kingdom's sake, Jesus. We just uh, submit everything into your hands, O oh Lord Father. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. So last week we started um, talking about the... Uh, authenticity and the accuracy of the scriptures. This is lesson number nine. Uh, we went through the first part of it. So I'll just quickly review uh, what we've covered and then we will finish. Uh, I think we should be able to finish the second part of lesson nine and the second hour today. We should be able to progress into our next lesson, lesson number 10. So let's quickly review uh, some of the things we've covered when we're talking about the scriptures. So this is a question again that uh, many people would uh, ask us about our scriptures. Uh, why do we believe in the Bible, you know, so confidently, so entirely? Uh, how do we know it's true, etc.? All right. Okay. So I'm just sharing the PDF. Um, lesson number nine, the Bible is authenticity and accuracy. Uh, just to quickly review, we went through um, some basic questions that we're trying to answer. That is, how do we know the scriptures are real? Uh, how were the books put together? You know, why are there these 66 books? And what about other literature that was written around the same time? And why are there so many different versions of the English Bible? These are some of the things we would like to understand and have answers for. Um, so we said the Bible, you know, claims for itself that it is the inspired word of God, that God breathed into it, God inspired people. And of course, it was written by godly men over a period of uh, almost 1,500 years. It was written over a period of time. Godly people wrote it, but they were inspired by God. And um, we understand uh, most of the scriptures were written, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, some parts of it were written in Aramaic, the New Testament in Greek. Um, how was it transmitted? Uh, through meticulous copying. Uh, on papyrus and then later on in, in a codex form, which is on animal skin, very meticulous, so on. And then we did a little comparison of uh, manuscripts, credentials, uh, looking at uh, ancient manuscripts and the number of the manuscripts and the time gap that we have, uh, and we compared it to what we have for the scriptures. So we give a little background to the scriptures, how... Um, both the number of manuscripts and the time gap is very, very small, uh, especially after the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, in 1947. So in summary, uh, we're saying the Old Testament time gap is just about 250 years, and the New Testament is just, you know, 40, 50 years. Um, and we have about 10,000 manuscripts of the Old Testament, and 24,000 manuscripts of the New Testament, um, uh, in, in this very small time gap. 
basically these are two criteria or things that we look at uh, to establish the reliability of text that we are reading of ancient uh, scriptures. So uh, we say that, you know, based on this, we could say the Bible is very, very reliable. The number of manuscripts, the time gap, we know that the text we are reading is close to the original. It has not been corrupted or as it was transmitted over many hundreds and thousands of years. So the reliability, the authenticity of the text we are reading is very reliable. We, were, we closed in, you know, towards the end of uh, last week, we had a little bit of discussion um, in Bible, Quran, and Vedas. Uh, we, we are not getting into too much detail there. Our goal is not to argue, not to compare. Uh, our goal is not to, uh, you know, point fingers or, you know, none of that. Our goal is just to present. This is what we know about the Bible. Others will have perspectives on their scriptures, and it's up to them to uh, compare and make their own decision. You're not here to argue and fight. Now, as we move forward, I want to bring our attention to a few other things and also talk about how the scriptures were canonized. That means the why do we have these 66 books are not other books. So we will spend some time on that. The canonization of scripture, how did all this come together, the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we'll spend some time on that. And then we will get into talking about the different English versions of the Bible. Right? So we will do that. Now, before we get into it, I just want to point out a few things. One is that the Lord Jesus himself quoted a lot from the Old Testament scriptures. That means from Genesis to Malachi. So when we say Old Testament, we are specifically speaking about the 39 books of the Old Testament. And the Lord Jesus in his ministry, in his life and ministry, actually quoted from this, the Old Testament scriptures, which means that by the time Jesus was ministering on the earth, there was an accepted set, as I said, in these 39 books, there was an accepted collection of Old Testament scriptures. And uh, of course, we talk about how it came together, but there was this set of Old Testament scriptures accepted by the Jewish people. And they looked at this as the Holy Scriptures. And the Lord Jesus himself quoted from it. And when you study uh, the Gospels and uh, look at how Jesus spoke from the scriptures. He used the Old Testament scriptures a lot. He used it when he was uh, over, you know, facing the devil in temptation. Uh, he pointed to the scriptures, and you know, many times he would say, "You know what the scriptures have said, right?" Uh, he said, "Heaven and earth will pass away, but not one word of the law will pass away." He also spoke about the reliability of historical law, you know, the, the facts that are presented there. He said, thy word is truth. Uh, he, he quoted from the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And when he was, both in Matthew and Luke, when he was speaking after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus, with two of his disciples or followers, he went through the entirety of the Old Testament scriptures. He went through the whole scriptures, Old Testaments, looking, pointing out to the scriptures that were speaking about him. So he journeyed through the scriptures, and these people were listening. Oh, you know. So the Lord Jesus was very well, uh, very familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. And he used that scriptures to point and say, point about him to himself. In fact, he told um, some of the scribes says, you know, search the scriptures. He's telling them, you search the scriptures, which is these collect the collection of 39 books, which they uh, had. So you search the scriptures because you know that it's life is in it. And he says, but they are, the scriptures are speaking of me. 
right? So we're saying, look, the Old Testament scriptures are actually speaking about him, pointing to him. So I want us to understand that the Lord Jesus himself recognized, acknowledged, he quoted from, he referenced, and he even used in his own personal life these 39 books of the Old Testament. Right? So that's very, very significant um, for us. Now, sometimes people may question the validity of the text, and when I say text, I mean both Old and New Testament text, uh, by pointing out what seem to be errors in the text. And there are different examples of this. Um, you know, let me say example, and let's look at, look at a few things, you know. Uh, for instance, in the Old Testament, we have First and Second Kings, we have First and Second Chronicles, which are a historical record, or you know, starting right from uh, uh, right from Genesis on. Uh, but uh, the Kings and Chronicles are somewhat parallel, and they are a historical record of what happened in the life of Israel and later on Israel and Judah after they separated as a, as a nation uh, during the time of the kings. And sometimes there seemed to be a little variation in how a particular incident is recorded. Or when you come into the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, uh, again, there may be a little variation in how a particular incident is recorded. Right? So people may point to this and say, hey, look, in one case, one of the gospel writers saying there was one demon possessed man. In another case, the other gospel writer about the same incident is saying there were two demon possessed men. So you see there's a contradiction in the scriptures. So things like that, you know. Um, so how do we respond to such things. And, you know, it's a very simple, logical response, nothing complicated. Um, we refer to this, or, you know, technically, uh, in, in logical thinking, it's the law of non-contradiction. That means, and, I, and we can illustrate it like this. Suppose uh, in a given day, at nine o'clock, I schedule a meeting with John, somebody, example, John. 10 o'clock, I schedule a meeting with, you know, somebody else, say, Mark. And then at 3 o'clock, I have a meeting with somebody else, say, you know, Paul. And when I meet Paul at 3 o'clock, if I tell him, hey, I met John today, that's a correct statement. Or... If I tell him, hey, I met John and Mark today, that is also a correct statement. So both my statements are true. If I say I met John, that is a correct statement. If I say I met John and Mark, that is also a correct statement. But there is a difference of information in these two statements, but neither of the statements are false. The these statements are not contradicting each other either. Just that one statement, when I say John, I, I met John and Mark today, that statement has more information than the statement that says, I met John today. Both statements are true, just one has more information, but they're not, then it's not a contradiction, right? So it, I, this is logical, uh, this is a simple example. So also in the Gospels, we do find that, you know, there will be certain details, whether Luke writes or somebody else writes, which are not found in the other Gospels about the same incident. It doesn't mean this is a contradiction in the scripture text. It just means that the Gospel writer is recording something that he felt was important that he wanted us to know. It's not a contradiction, it's just that there's a difference in what is recorded.
And like this, you know, we, we understand this. You can, you, can, you can use many examples in our day-to-day -day conversations when we say things uh, only, or when you really communicate with a written form or a spoken form. We use this, right? And it's not that we are saying something untrue. Both statements are true. It's just that the amount of information that is communicated is different. So that's one response when people find, hey, there's a difference in the stories that are recorded either in the Old Testament or New Testament, and we can explain it that way. Secondly, there's uh, again uh, another thing that people may point to as error saying, hey, uh, this passage is so difficult to understand. What does it mean? Now, things are difficult for us to understand because we are living in a different context. Right, we are living sometimes, but two thousand years after, or sometimes it's in some. If it's the New Testament, it's two thousand times after. If it's the Old Testament, it's three, four, five thousand years later. Right, so there is a huge time gap, and so there's a difference in our context. And then what may have been very clear and simple to the writer in recording something. To us, it's maybe very difficult to understand. Yeah. So, example, in the book of Job, Job writes about you know strange things, like he says, Leviathan. So we read, what is that? You know, what is it? It it has we we have no context for it other than look, we know there are big animals, uh, but we don't have an animal called Leviathan. Uh, Job writes about this. So we need to understand that that doesn't mean it's an error in the text, just because we have no such thing as Leviathan in our understanding today. But it simply means that there existed a, you know, certain creatures, and we don't know for sure what it is, which was very big and you know, a big animal. Uh, which in the text, translated text, is referred to as Leviathan. But we don't know what it is for sure. But that doesn't mean that is an error or there's something wrong in the text. It just means we are in a different you know, time frame. And if we are able to get information on either the culture or the history, we will be able to understand that a little better. So that's another important thing uh, for us to present when people say hey, there are errors in the Bible. Look at this story, or how could this be? Or and we say, look, we are in a different time frame. But if we can take some time to study the culture or the history, things will become clearer for us and we understand why they said what they said or why they did what they did. And uh, you know, this can come up in many different scenarios. You know, when, it, for example, people ask a lot of questions. So look at how much uh, how much bloodshed there is in the Old Testament. There's so many wars and fightings, and killing, uh, destroying of tribes, destroying of cities. What does all that mean, right? So then we have to say, look, in those con in the those times, that was the way they had to gain territory, and that was the way they had to. Uh, possess land, and that's where they had to defend themselves and so on. That was part of the times, uh, the way of life in those times. So it was, it was part of the way they lived, uh, or, you know, in, in, in destroying cities and so on. Um, or in, when you come in to the New Testament, uh, you say, look, Paul something says, you know, Women, he addresses women specifically how they dress, how they conduct themselves. So, or he tells, you know, this, this whole thing about head covering, so many things like that, where some people can use those passages and say, look, look, the Bible is putting women down, the Bible is, uh, you know, uh, not giving women equal place uh, before God, so on and so forth. But then we say, okay, let's understand the cultural, the historical setting, and we can interpret, explain it based on that information, that knowledge. Right. So 
two things to keep in mind when people try to point out errors or contradictions in scripture. One is the way narratives have been recorded for us about incidents. Um, second is trying to understand the culture and the, the history and the context in which something was written will help clear up our understanding. Okay. So just wanted to mention these two things. Um, are there any questions on this before we start talking about the canon of scripture? Any questions on these two things? Okay, it runs with me so far. Fine, so let's move forward. And we want to talk about the canon of scripture, which is um, why, or not, you know, why are there these 39 plus 27 books that we call as the Bible? How do they all get put together, right? Who decided? <laughs> It's got to be these 39 and these 27. Who decided that? How was it? You know, and when did it happen? Right? So we're going to uh, 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 talk about that. So I'll just summarize. And I, now I have collected the information, of course. I just put it in the notes. Uh, you can read it uh, in depth. But I'll just summarize that for us so we have an idea about the canon of Scripture. So... Uh, the word canon, right, uh, it just simply means standard or a, a, a line that is drawn. So this is you know, a line or this is the standard at which, uh, uh, by which we live. And also when we say the canon of scripture, it means two things, right? It's, it's a standard by which we live, but also means these, these books have met a certain standard um, because of which they are part of the scriptures. Okay? Canon means a standard, a rule, a line that's yeah, drawn. So we know, okay, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27, 27 in the New. Okay, who decided that this was going to be there, that these books were going to be in these uh, in the scriptures? What determined them to uh, for them to be there? Now, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew. Bible as so very important criteria was for the Jews. And I'm just summarizing, you know, the content that's in the notes. You can read it. For the Jews, the Hebrews, very important was these were prophets of God who were speaking. Very important. And these were recorded as part of their spiritual journey. So the law of Moses, the first five books, right, the law of Moses, it was given through Moses. Now, of course, Moses was not there in the Garden of Eden, but it was given to him by revelation. And Moses wrote down by revelation things that God had revealed. Moses put that down for, for us. So the first five books came through the prophet Moses. That's very important. That means these were scriptures given through prophets, people who were inspired by God. And then the second section of the Old Testament scriptures were called the prophets. Um, and they were what we would refer to as the major and the minor prophets. That means they, just looking at the influence these prophets had. And uh, these were prophets men appointed by God who prophesied and the, the things they prophesied along with the history around which they prophesied or during which time they prophesied was all recorded starting from Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings and so on right? and the minor prophets. So these were men who are recognized to be people inspired by God, the words they spoke, the situations, the history, 
around which they were speaking was all recorded. And those books referred to the, the major and the minor prophets, those books, again, were treated very sacred by the Hebrews. And the last portion of it is just referred to as the writings, which consists of other 11 books. There are more books, uh, more of the books that were uh, uh, poetry or wisdom or psalms of prayer, prayer and worship, part of their, uh, their uh, spiritual journey, as well as some of it was uh, part of what happened, the record of what happened during the exile and the return back to their, the land. So these writings were also sacred. A lot of it were given through prophets like David. Uh, Solomon, we won't call him a prophet, but he was definitely a man anointed by the wisdom of God. So his writings or his sayings. And then, of course, we have Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah. So these were all considered sacred. So essentially, these 39 books over a period of time, they've met certain criteria and they were held as sacred writings by the Jews. The criteria was this was given through the prophets of men who were inspired by God, men upon whom the hand of God was. Now, I, you know, when I say prophets, we understand that like Solomon or Nehemiah or Ezra may not be necessarily regarded as prophets, but they were men whom God had chosen, whom God was working through or speaking through. And, and the things they said, did, and the history around the times in which they lived and served were all recorded, and these scriptures were considered as sacred. Okay. So there was a certain criteria that went into these scriptures being selected. The underlying thing was these men were people who were inspired by God or who they could recognize and God's hand was upon them. And so those books were considered. Now, obviously, uh, during this time, uh, there were other things being written by other people. You know, other people are recording history or other people may have written lots of other things. And sometimes even uh, in, you know, for example, in Kings and Chronicles, the Old Testament is actually making mention that, hey, somebody else has recorded something, right? So it's okay. Uh, the, the life of this king was recorded in this literature, in this book. That, that doesn't make that book sacred. It's just that Kings or Chronicles is telling us that the things that this king did, apart from what's recorded here, was also recorded by somebody else in writing, recording history. So there is obvious reference to other material that was being, that other people were writing who are recording historical events, things going on during those, those times. The interesting thing is none of those, that literature is available, it's found. Whereas these 39 books have been preserved somehow, you know, we would say, uh, I, I, you know, generally people say, oh, it was just coincidence. No, I don't think it's coincidence. It was God's hand on these 39 books that these books were preserved, even though there were other people writing other things, you know, during those times, which are actually mentioned here, but none of them survived. None of them were able to last through time. But these 39 books, but they were only preserved and they survived through time. So somewhere around 400 B BC, and uh, again, this is not known for, for sure, but Ezra, Ezra the priest, who was there during the exile to Babylon, during the 70 year exile to Babylon, and who was able, and he was very, you know, you can imagine, he was very old at this time, aged at this time. So he was, when he came back, he is credited to as somebody who preserved 
this collection of 39 books. He's responsible, he's credited with that saying, hey, how did these 39 books survive all, you know, the Jews were attacked, everything, uh, the temple was destroyed, the city was destroyed and by the, you know, by different the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. And how did these 39 books survive? A lot of other things were lost or destroyed. Uh, how did they survive? How were they brought back safely to the Jewish people? And that's where Ezra the priest is, is, is given you know, the credit that he must have had an important role to play. Because when the people came back, and you read about this, both in Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, uh, Ezra, you know, he's the one you know, reading and bringing out the scriptures for the people. And so Ezra the priest, God must have used him uh, to preserve these 39 books safely, you know, while there was all these things happening, uh, the invasions and attacks and destruction of Jerusalem. He must have done a very important work in preserving these scriptures and bringing it back into Jerusalem, even when it was the temple was rebuilt and reestablished. So um, Ezra uh, is credited to this uh, doing this. And the criteria, as I mentioned, uh, that why the Jewish people regarded these 39 books as sacred, very important criteria. Again, it wasn't like some committee was sitting and deciding these things. It was something that was, you know, that that just happened in the life of these Hebrews and they began to regard these 39 books. It was, you know, the inspiration uh, uh, was the hand of God upon the speaker. Could he be recognized as a genuine prophet of God? Uh, did it agree with the, uh, the teachings of the earlier prophets, what was already given to them? Uh, did other subsequent prophets recognize these as uh, you know, inspired scriptures? And then obviously they'll all survive through time. So these are implicit criteria. And it's implicit meaning it's not like you know some committee was sitting and said, okay, we have these five criteria, and uh, the texts that fulfill these five criteria, we will make it sacred. No, no, no. As these books were being written, they were accepted as sacred because of these reasons. The person speaking was speaking on inspiration. The person speaking was a general prophet of God. And as as it was being written, yeah, it's in agreement with the doctrine of God, with the teaching that we have received, starting from the, the words given to us through Moses. And it is being recognized by prophets. And of course, it's survived through time. Okay? So by 400 BC, Malachi is the last recognized prophet. By this time, these 39 books are already in place, including the writings, uh, the words of Malachi, the prophet. And so after that, nothing else has been added to this collection of 39 books, which today we call as the Old Testament, right? Because after Malachi, there was no other recognized prophet who came on the scene until John the Baptist. That is, we're crossing over into what we refer to as the New Testament period. So until Malachi, or after Malachi, Malachi was the last one, the last recognized prophet. After him, there was no recognized prophet. And uh, there were, like I mentioned earlier, there was you know, many different historical writings. And uh, after Malachi, there were other things that were written, but these were not considered sacred because they didn't meet the previous criteria. And they, these were not writings of prophets, of men upon whom, people upon whom the hand of God was. And so the Jewish people, and neither did the church at a later, at a later point, consider these writings during, after Malachi the prophet, they didn't consider them as sacred. They didn't meet that criteria. They didn't meet the canon or the standard by which these books were selected. There was no evidence of divine inspiration uh, in you know, these other books. Although the Catholic Church and some of the Orthodox and 
Russian uh, author of Shukla. They look, they include these scriptures under this section called Apocrypha. But they're merely considered human works, such as you know, some writings of people, literature, but they're not considered sacred. Then we transition into the New Testament period, which after Malachi, 400 years of silence. Then we have John the Baptist coming on the scene and the four gospels being written. The four gospels are essentially a record of what happened from the time of John the Baptist leading into the ministry of the Lord Jesus, his death, burial, resurrection and ascension. And these were written again during the first hundred years as so within a, a, a 70 year period after the actual events. So that means we say um, the life of the ministry of Jesus, and these are approximate dates, 80 till about 80, 30, or 33. Then you have the gospels being written within the next 50 to 70 years. The four gospels are written, and then the writings of the apostles, and so on. But they were not canonized at that time. The, the, the scriptures were written. Uh, uh, initially, the words of Jesus were transmitted orally. The apostles were sharing, speaking, preaching. This is what Jesus taught us. This is what Jesus said. And then they were then written down uh, by the apostles. There, were the, there was a revelation given through Paul, which was also written down in letters. So these things were written down, but they were not immediately called the New Testament. They knew, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul's letters, the other apostles, James, Jude, Peter, and John. They wrote the other, you know, the other letters, but these were not compiled together. They were recognized for what they were. They, they, these are the writings of the apostles. They were written and were recognized, of course, during the early times of the early church. It was only around AD 300. That means we're going about 200 years after the writings. So if you say the writings were written during the first 100 years or during the 50 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, 50 to 70 years after that, they were written, they were recognized that they were written by the apostles. So the letters were there, but they had not been put together as the New Testament yet. Everybody was still, rec was still recognizing these are the writings of the apostle. Yes. But it was only around 350 AD, about 250 years later, that a bishop of uh, Alexandria, that he officially stated, hey, these 27 books, we are going to recognize as sacred books of the New Testament. Okay. Up until the time, people, in a very loose way, were recognizing these things. And you have, um, in this little example here, the apostolic, that was during those first 100 years, the teachings were transmitted, spoken, written down, people recognize the right things. Uh, the next 100, uh, 100, 150 years, again, the teachings were held with great respect and authority. Uh, it was all written down, the sacred scriptures were there, but they had not yet officially, you know, put them all together. Then came later on, in a very loose way, people were recognizing, hey, you know, these books, some were looking at 26, 27, these are sacred scriptures, these are the writings of the apostles. But so, you know, different, what we say is councils or groups of leaders, elders were recognizing these books. Um, and the, the heads of different churches were recognizing these books as, you know, as, as New Testament and eventually around uh, AD uh, 350, uh, it was officially, you know, or 8367, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it was officially being stated by these leaders that these 27 books are the books of the New Testament. So again, it's not 
uh, set one single committee that uh, decided this, but we are seeing that as these were written, people were recognizing these were being written by the apostles. They were holding them with high regard as authority. They were you know, making copies of it, sharing, teaching, preaching from it. And then eventually the heads of different churches in and around uh, that region, we're talking about uh, around the Mediterranean, where the churches were established by that time, they began to recognize these 27 books, this collection of 27 books as the canon of scripture. And so these 27 books, along with 39 books of the Old Testament, then became the Bible. Now remember what we said, the Lord Jesus quoted extensively from the 39 books of the Old Testament. When the early church began, so we're talking about the first 30 years of the early church from AD 30 to up to AD 60, or actually, you know, Paul started writing his letters around uh, AD 45. So at least the first 15 years, most of the teaching and the preaching of the early church was from the Old Testament. They recognized because Jesus himself preached from the Old Testament. The first 15 years, they didn't have what we refer to as the New Testament. They didn't have any of the letters of the Apostle Paul yet. So those first 15 years, until Paul started writing and then the Gospels, everything was recorded. They were preaching from the Old Testament scriptures along with the teachings of Jesus, which they personally heard. That was the essence of the preaching and the teaching. Okay? So the early church implicitly accepted 39 books of the Old Testament as part of the Holy Scriptures. It became part of the church because that was the preaching and the teaching, which was, which was actually started by Jesus. Jesus said, hey, these 39 books are speaking about me. The apostles continued it. They quoted and taught from the Old Testament, plus everything they heard Jesus preach and teach during his earthly ministry. And then came the record of scripture, which is the writings of the Apostle Paul, uh, the writing of the four Gospels, finally, the book of Revelation around AD 90 was written. Okay? So the, old, the 39 books of the Old Testament became part of the, the New Testament church. It is part of our faith. Our faith is based on the teachings of the Old Testament scripture along with the 27 books of the New Testament. And so these were, this was compiled together as the Bible. Right? So that term, Bible, uh, again, it was uh, only around uh, 200 AD that uh, you know people started referring to the, using the term, the Biblia, the Bible. Okay. which in a very loose way referred to the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books that were accepted as the written scriptures by the apostles. In a very loose way, but only later on, around uh, you know, mid-350 AD, uh, it was officially recognized. Okay. And then it was very much later, around 1560, that chapter, chapters and verses were introduced the, in the English Bible, the first Bible in English, chapter and verse was the Geneva Bible, published around 1560. So it was a long way off you know, before we got the English Bible and got it in, in the form that we have today in chapter and verse. Okay. So let me pause here. So that that's kind of gives us a little background on how the canon of scripture came together and uh, how we have these 39 plus 27 books of the Bible. I'll pause here before we get into the you know, translation and take any questions that we might have. Any questions? This is about the canon of scripture. How did the scriptures come together? 
Y'all good? Could you all follow with me? Oh, did you get lost somewhere? Okay. Seems like everyone has, anyway, you're most welcome to ask questions anytime. All right. Um, all right, maybe before we start our next, so what we've done is we talked about the canon of scripture, how these 39 plus 27 books all came together. Our next question is, why are, how are translations done? So remember, Old Testament, Hebrew, mainly Hebrew, New Testament, mainly Greek. Today we have English Bibles. We can read it in English, and not just English, but we have so many versions of English Bible. So we want to understand how these translations are done. And secondly, why are there so many versions of the Bible? What is the difference between you know these different versions of the Bible? And why are people continuing to make new versions? Uh, what's the whole purpose behind it, why can't we just stay with King James or New King James? And why are we having these new, uh, 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 you know, versions? Okay. So, yeah, Ren is saying, we learn the canon and all of scripture in the Old Testament so fast. Okay, great. That's good. It's good to revise and you know, repeat that. Okay. So, Let's pause here. We'll come back in 10 minutes and then we'll get into looking at um, translations, right? How are these English translations done? And what's the difference between the different English versions of the Bible? So we should finish that. And then with that, we'll kind of wrap up this lesson and we'll move into lesson number 10 after that. Okay. So we'll get back in 10 minutes. <laughs> 